This is ADT 1160U, Digital Communication Technologies. The title for this particular video clip is as follows. Good communication is face-to-face -face communication. The analysis questions for the following video clip are as follows. What do people decode when they are in a face-to-face -face conversation? How did communication evolve in the last century? What is different between face-to-face -face communication and virtual communication? A century ago, when a young man wanted to marry a woman, he had to create an occasion to meet her parents and try to impress them. He would have to wait until the time was appropriate to ask her hand, and usually this was done in a family gathering, where there would be witnesses. If the young lovers were separated for whatever reason, they would write letters to each other. Letters were nowhere like being close to the loved one, but it created a different relationship. People shared their thoughts differently in letters than they did face to face. It was a moment of history when people took the time to think of a message, then write a letter at night by the light of an oil lamp, and had to wait weeks before getting a reply. Then the phone came and people were able to speak to each other from one part of town to the other. It was also possible for a cost to call other cities and eventually people could call in other countries. The phone, however, was not always perceived as the best mode of communication because you couldn't see the body language of the other person. There was also a lot of distortion, so it was sometimes not even possible to know if the right person speaking. People were dubious. Back then, there was nothing like a face-to-face -face conversation. When speaking face-to-face, -face, there are 43 muscles in the face that move and provide the speaker with information that adds to the utterances. Simply put, an utterance is the smallest unit of speech that people put together in exchange in order to create meaning through language. Hearing an utterance sometimes puts it out of context if the tonic accent is not on the right syllable. Or maybe should I say on the right syllable. Think of the word desert for example. It can refer to either a geographical area that has little precipitations per year, or it can refer to sweet food that you can consume after a meal. We usually know which concept we're referring to because we contextualize it with other utterances. For example, if someone said, I had a great desert last night, we know that they are referring to food and not to a geographical area. If someone says, I visited the desert of Sahara, we know that they are referring to a geographical area and not food. It is as simple as this. Now let's look at it in another way. If someone says something and they are not serious about it, we look at their body language, their facial expression, and we know this person is joking because we get additional visual cues. Sometimes. Some people are easier to read than others, and some people read body language better than others. These factors are affected by individual differences. When information and communication technology came around, a large part of the population adopted email and chat as a mode of communication. The desktop and the laptop became an interface through which people communicated. Needless to say, not only were there no auditory cues with a tone of voice, there were also no more body language cues. One of the first reactions that people had was to create emoticons. The idea was to add some kind of emotion or tone to the conversation to ensure that the message was well understood. We saw several symbols appear such as happy face, winking, sticking your tongue out, and more. The other mechanism that emerged from chat and email is abbreviations such as LOL, ROFL, BRB, and etc. These became very important as people started texting. What is interesting is that LOL, which means laugh out loud, and ROFL, which means roll on the floor, are abbreviations that people use to add emotion. But people don't necessarily laugh out loud or roll on the floor when they write it. As technologies evolved, it became possible to do audio conferencing or video conferencing. Sometimes people like video conferencing, but sometimes they opt for chat. 
It really depends on what the requirements are for the conversation. Face-to-face -face communication will always exist, as virtual communication was never intended to replace it, but it created a climate of communication where being present was no longer required. Today, many conversations occur between people who wouldn't be able to be in presence, and it is because of virtual communication. There is also the fact that sometimes, virtual communication is sometimes more efficient than face-to-face -face communication. Think of the tutorials for this course. As the instructor speaks, you are completely free to engage in chat, whether it be in the main window or in a private chat with other students. In a face-to-face -face class, if you started talking with your colleagues, it would probably be seen as disruptive behavior. In that case, virtual communication is an enhancement of face-to-face -face communication. The synthesis questions for the following video clip are as follows. Why did people invent additional mechanisms in virtual communication? What is authentic conversation? And finally, is face-to-face -face communication really better than virtual communication?